I honestly think tonight is the night that broke everybody's fucking spirit. Tonight's the night that just broke everybody. Tonight's the night that broke the camel's back. It was the last straw that broke the camel's back, man. I am done. I am done. I think Monday Night Raw is the worst fucking show that professional wrestling has ever seen. And if anybody has the balls to come out on any fucking platform in which they occupy and say anything positive or try to find any redeeming qualities to this show, I swear upon everything that is holy on this earth, I swear on my grandfather's tomb, you don't belong in front of a microphone, you don't deserve a platform to speak your opinion on professional wrestling. There is zero positive about this show. Do not even attempt to find one iota of positivity on this show. I don't know how Michael Cole and Corey Graves can even stand their job week after week doing the same thing over and over and over again, bickering like fucking idiots every single week over bullshit that absolutely nobody gives a shit about. This is fucking terrible. For everybody in Milwaukee, you, and I love Milwaukee, Rusty, if you're listening to me, brother, listen, man, this has nothing to do with where you're from or the fine people of Milwaukee. This is merely about the people who paid money to sit in that arena tonight. This goes out to everybody if you're listening to me. You are a bunch of fucking imbeciles. I do not feel one ounce of sorrow for anybody that paid their hard-earned money to sit in that arena tonight and watch this fucking show. How do you feel at the end of the night knowing that you worked and you slaved away to people that don't give a shit about you, to a boss who probably don't give a fuck if you're alive, to a district manager who comes in who don't even know you by name. You're merely a fucking number on a paycheck. How do you feel about working and slaving away to these people and then you take that money that you worked so hard for and you give it to WWE to attend a show like this? I ask you, why would you do such a thing And then I sit here and I laugh at you for the decision that you made. I feel not one ounce of sorrow for anybody in that arena tonight. In my eyes, you are a bunch of fucking idiots. You may be the dumbest fucks I think I have ever seen in human form. This tweet that you've been looking at for the last three minutes is pinned at the top of my Twitter page. There will be about 40,000 views on this video with about 3,000 likes. I swear upon my grandfather's fucking tomb, and that's the second time in this video that I said that. If you do not go to my Twitter page, and if there's not 4,000, 40,000, I don't know if I said 4,000 or 40,000, 40,000 fucking retweets on this particular tweet, if there's not 3,000 likes on this particular tweet, that I so conveniently tagged Vince McMahon in by his Twitter handle. I didn't merely subtweet him. I didn't subtweet anybody else. Directed at the man himself, who I'm sure was sitting in gorilla most of the night. Hey, Vince McMahon, fans like me and everyone else are truly sick and tired of the same repetitive, boring garbage... That was once a beautiful way to spend Monday night. Raw needs a change. What you've given us is truly embarrassing on every level. We demand better. At the time of this recording, this is over 1,000 likes. It accumulated that number there, 227 likes in a span of five minutes when I posted that initially. This show is fucking Horrendous. I pray 
to whatever God is looking down on this earth. I pray to him and I want everybody to do the same. I swear on everything that I wish and I hope all elite wrestling becomes a fucking reality. Vince McMahon needs his ego fucking crushed into every fucking single piece that is humanly possible. Just like he crushes our spirit every single week. I don't know how any of these fucking people in this company can look themselves in the face when they wake up in the morning to brush their fucking teeth and think back to what kind of work they did on Monday Night Raw and say, man, we did a damn good job. Man, we continued some good stories on this show. This is not how an A show operates. This is not a fucking Monday Night Raw. This is absolute fucking subhuman levels of absolute fucking garbage. I'm done. I'm completely fucking done with this show. This show doesn't even deserve a fucking hour review, but I'm sure I'll go about an hour because, man, do I have a lot to say on this fucking show. And then, to top it all off, WWE has one instance to create a new star or start a refreshing storyline, or make a big splash on this show. Seth Rollins has an open challenge on this show. What do they do for the fucking 2018th fucking time this year? We get Dolph Ziggler versus Seth Rollins in a match that we've been seeing religiously almost every fucking week, every single month on this show since June. That's what you call an open challenge? That's what we waited for. That's what you had Seth Rollins go out there on his phone and tweet the U.S. Open or the Inter U.S. Open Intercontinental whatever fucking open challenge Intercontinental open challenge on Monday Night Raw's coming back. Why? Why is it coming back? Because you're too fucking lazy to write me a fucking segment on this three-hour piece of shit. You had anybody at your disposal to give me in this open challenge. And Dolph Ziggler's the fucking first name that you come up with. I could list 10 guys off the top of my head right now that I would love to see more in that role. Buddy Murphy, Mustafa Ali, Ricochet, Adam Cole. You could have put fucking Drew McIntyre in there for the Intercontinental Championship. We get the fucking title on him because he ain't winning the Universal Championship anytime soon. Because Death, uh, Seth and Dean don't need the Intercontinental Championship. Lars Sullivan, Bray Wyatt, could have been anybody in NXT. Anybody. Now, but you want to give us Dolph Ziggler. What about EC3 or Tyler Breeze? What about those types of guys? Apollo Crews. Anybody. Anybody. And you give us Dolph fucking Ziggler. I don't understand the logic of these people. It exists nowhere on this show. Nowhere. How many fucking times are you going to give me the same goddamn fucking match on this show? Look at your roster. There is no one. You have a depleted roster. You have the greatest roster of talent ever assembled. And this is the fucking shit that you're giving me. This is the creativity that you're giving me on a Monday night as I waste my life away for three fucking hours. I don't understand it. I don't understand it. You should be fucking ashamed of yourself. Everybody writing this show should be fucking ashamed of themselves. US Open Challenge, I see title Open Challenge. What are these open challenges for? What purpose do they serve? This is merely 30 minutes in a show in which you can't creatively give me anything different just to fill a 30-minute spot, just to give me a segment out of 16 filled. How do we fill this segment on the show? Yeah, we'll do an open challenge. That means absolutely fucking nothing to anybody. How many times do we have to see this match? Yes, we get the fucking point. We get the point. 
Ziggler and Rollins have a great chemistry together. They could put on a five-star classic if given the opportunity. We understand that. But if I have pizza seven nights of the fucking week for dinner every night, aren't you going to get fucking bored of it? If I go to a fucking bar that offers 500 craft beers, different drafts, and I go there and I fucking like an idiot sit there and order a goddamn Budweiser. And I have Budweiser all night for three fucking hours. Aren't you going to get bored? God, I fucking hate this show. This show is a fucking abysmal piece of shit. I'm done. I'm absolutely fucking done. This show offered me nothing. Nothing. In ways of storyline, getting me excited for TLC. This shows you exactly why we need all elite wrestling or another wrestling promotion to come along in the United States and fucking shake the foundation to its core where these people are fucking literally pissing their pants. Seriously. Before we even get into the fucking show, let me talk about actually... Something that means something to you people. We have off the script this weekend. We talk about all elite wrestling. They could have elite problems in 2019. That was on part one. Go and check it out. Bray Wyatt to replace Braun Strowman at TLC. Clearly, that's not the case. Otherwise, he would have made an appearance on tonight's show. So go and listen to part three. That was uploaded on Sunday. Part two. Current plans for Seth Rollins include Rollins and Lesnar for the Universal Championship. But one little caveat there, it's going to be revolving around Roman Reigns and his leukemia announcement. So we go over all that off the script, spend about five hours plus this weekend. You're not going to find a harder working individual in the YWC than me right here. Go and check that stuff out. Thank you guys so very much for all the support. They are live on the channel right now for your viewing pleasure. I want to thank everybody for buying t-shirts, man. I sold about seven t-shirts tonight during Raw alone. Thank you guys so very much. Barbershop Windows Black Friday sale is over. If you missed the deal, you missed out on 35% off any of my 18 shirts. Now we're back to going back to regular discounts. Barbershopwindow.com slash off the script. Use code BSHOP20 to get your merchandise and support the podcast in the very best way. And that's wearing the brand on your back. Barbershopwindow.com slash off the script. Everybody that bought a t-shirt in the month of November, in the month of November, you guys are going to get a shout out on episode 250 of the podcast this coming weekend. And if you guys are not following me on social media at JD from NY206, hit that subscribe button down below. Give that bell, just like you give Monday Night Raw every week, the fucking middle finger, and turn on those notifications. If you guys want to support the podcast on Patreon, patreon.com slash JD from NY206. Monday Night Raw started off with Baron Corbin standing in the ring with Drew McIntyre and Bobby Lashley, who is now being called the almighty Bobby Lashley. What the fuck does that mean? And why did I have to hear it 27 different fucking times tonight. What on earth makes Bobby Lashley almighty? I have no fucking idea. You know, he wears sunglasses inside. You know what they say about people who wear sunglasses inside. You're a massive fucking cunt. That's what that means. He looks like a complete fucking idiot. Posing, wearing a vest, showing off his fucking muscles. This is the Bobby Lashley that you all wanted, right? A heel. And he still sucks. He is still complete, utter trash. Braun Strowman is out. He is no longer going to be involved with TLC. Go figure. WWE booked him at TLC. And here we are now, just a week later after the vicious attack. And now he is no longer going to be a part of TLC. Does anybody give a shit about Braun Strowman being out? I certainly don't. I don't want to see him on Raw. I don't want to see him in the Universal Championship. I don't want to see him in a match with Brock Lesnar. Period. It's over. I explained that on the podcast this week. That ship has sailed. They made him into a fucking loser. No matter how many things he destroyed, no matter how many fucking weeks he tormented every single person on that roster, he is a fucking 
loser. The guy can go to New York City and climb the Empire State Building like fucking King Kong and destroy Manhattan in a single blow like the fucking creature from that movie from J.J. Abrams there. Whatever the fucking shit's called. I can't even think of it right now. That fucking big sea creature that came up from the fucking, uh, from uh, the Hudson River and destroyed New York City. All you seen was the fucking Statue of Liberty's head rolled down fucking Fifth Avenue. He could do that and he'd still be a fucking loser. Cloverfield. He could literally be the creature from Cloverfield and you still couldn't get me to get interested in Braun Strowman. That's how you fucked him over. It's over. Have him remain out. He ain't gonna beat Brock Lesnar. He's not going into WrestleMania as the Universal Champion. And if you do, you're actually doing a disservice to WrestleMania. So Baron Corbin, Drew McIntyre, and Bobby Lashley are in the ring. And you could watch this show for 10 minutes. I swear to God, I could have had Spider-Man-like hearing. I heard people universally reaching for their remote control, changing the channel. All you needed to do was watch this show for 10 minutes, and then you got the premise of where this show was going. Awful. After 10 minutes, god awful. This is how Monday Night Raw opened up for all of us plebeians watching at home. Now I know what all of you are thinking. After a brutal attack like that, you won't be seeing Braun Strowman's face on Monday Night Raw for a long, long, long long time but 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 i happen to have a little bit of pull around here so that's not the case i sent a camera crew to birmingham alabama where braun Strowman is being prepped for surgery so let's see what the maimed monster had to say i'm in birmingham alabama as you can see getting ready to have surgery on this. And he shows his elbow. It's all bruised. But I would much rather be in Milwaukee. Because I know there's three spineless slime balls in Milwaukee right now that have some payback coming to them. Now, my surgeon says I'm going to be on the shelf for a little bit because he's never seen an injury like this before. Nor has he ever had to work on an arm this he's side. He's never seen an injury like this before? So a renowned fucking world doctor like Dr. James out. Andrews has never seen an injury like that I before? Are be you fucking kidding me? And when I am, the attack on me last week and the gore the surgeon's going to go through on my surgery today are going to seem like paper cuts compared to what I do to Corbin. Blah, Lashley, blah, 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 blah. Lashley. Shut the fuck up. Because when I get back, all three of you are going to get these hands. Okay, we get it. He said it. You're chanting it. We get it. We're going to get these hands. The that's like if those hands even work after his surgery. Ha 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 ha, yeah, you're real Look, funny, Trashley. The way I see it, there's no way Braun Strowman will be medically cleared to compete at TLC. And that's just too bad because our match is still on. And when Braun Strowman fails to show up, I win by four feet. Guarantee he shows up and they do exactly what I mentioned in the podcast this weekend. He's going to fucking destroy Baron Corbin. In turn, burying Baron Corbin, making him look like an idiot. All then he loses his job and Alexa Bliss is promoted as GM. If they want to be on the right side of history or the wrong side of history. So everybody in that locker room. Turn on the lights right now or somebody is getting fired. It is yes. Now, I honestly thought when the lights went out, Bray Wyatt was going to show up in the ring. And then we heard the guitar. Oh, I am Elias. And Elias is on stage. Now, I couldn't possibly sit back there any longer and listen to your annoying voice. Now, you're sitting out here talking about being the, you know, the permanent general manager, and I, I can't think of anything worse. I mean, 
literally anyone would be better than you. I mean, Leo Rush would be better than you, and I, I gotta believe that violates all kind of, you know, child labor laws. <laughs> if everyone could silence their cell phones, hold their applause, and, oh, Baron, if you do the whole world a favor and shut your mouth. Amen. Sing this little song for Bobby. If this was bodybuilding, you'd be top of the class. But why are you always bent over with Leo Rush pointing at your ass? It's when you're feeling depressed and feeling down on your luck, know that it could get worse. You could be Bobby Lashley, and Bobby Lashley sucks. Bobby Lashley sucks. Don't agree more, man. Oh, Bobby Lashley sucks. Say Bobby Lashley sucks. Say Don't agree more. There we go. What they conveniently <laughs> left out, though, what they conveniently left out in this little particular clip that they posted on their YouTube channel. And please, please, for the fucking internet trolls out there who want to fucking come at me and say, oh, they don't listen to shows like me, or why would they listen to an idiot like you? I have been calling Bobby Lashley, Bobby Trashley, since May, okay? I've been calling him that since May. We are now going into December. So please, don't tell me that they had all this time to come up with that nice little pun for Bobby Lashley, and now all of a sudden, we hear it, on Monday Night Raw. That is not a coincidence that was actually lifted from this program. And I wholeheartedly believe that. So that was the way Monday Night Raw opened up. No different from last week. Absolutely no different from last week. I do have one question, though. I do have one question. Can someone please fill me in as to why Drew McIntyre, Baron Corbin, and Bobby Lashley look like it's a new stable? It looks like a new stable is forming on Monday Night Raw right before our very eyes, but they don't officially have a name yet. And why is Drew McIntyre aligned with two other men when he was previously aligned with Dolph Ziggler? Did they ever finish that storyline as to why Drew McIntyre and Dolph Ziggler split away? The last I remember seeing is Drew McIntyre was kind of belittling Dolph Ziggler in a one-on-one -on -one promo with Finn Balor. And after that, they were no longer standing side by side. Are we going to get a conclusion as to why Dolph Ziggler has not mentioned Drew McIntyre and vice versa? Or am I to believe that they are no longer working together and an explanation is not needed because you don't think that the fans realize what is going on? So I would appreciate an explanation. I'm sure everybody listening to me would appreciate an explanation. I don't know why Drew McIntyre is associated with anybody. When the guy has championship material written all over him and he can do things on his own without anybody else just perfectly. So I don't understand that one. Which boggles my mind. So we got a very formulaic open to Monday Night Raw. No different than any other week. People reaching for their remote controls after 10 minutes. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. I heard a bunch of clicks going over to Monday Night Football or some fucking Christmas movie that's majorly cringe on Lifetime or maybe the Holiday Baking Championships on the Food Network. Maybe a rerun of Porn Stars. Maybe some fucking MTV show floor, Bama Shore or fucking uh, I Had a Kid at fucking 13 or whatever the fuck they're showing on MTV nowadays. Right? Anything but Monday Night Raw. So nothing's changed. Great creativity you got there, Vince McMahon. Great care for a show that you call The A-Show. So then we get Bobby Lashley going one-on-one -on -one with Elias. Now, I don't know who the fuck would be interested in seeing this again. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't this the third time that we've seen this in about a month and a half? Now, this isn't uh, no Kenny Omega or Kazuchika Okada type matchup here. Or, or even a Ricochet versus an Adam Cole like matchup in NXT, but, uh, I mean, give me a fucking break. 
Bobby Lashley in the opening match of Monday Night Raw is not going to maintain viewership on through the next hour and beyond. The guy is absolutely fucking awful. I mentioned this once, and I'm going to state it again for everybody who's listening to me. If I had a stroke in WWE, if I had a magic wand, Bobby Lashley would disappear faster than you can fucking breathe, and he would not be on my payroll any longer. The guy is absolutely a charisma vacuum, and he brings no value to any portion of Monday Night Raw. I don't give a fuck what he did in Impact. I don't give a shit how good of a heel he was three years ago under Dixie Carter. I don't care. The guy is fucking terrible. And he does not have wrestling skill to back anything up that you guys usually praise him on. He is terrible. Get him away from this show. Now, I could say the same thing for Elias, but I actually like Elias. He has a character that I'm actually invested in. A character I want to see more of on this show. A character I'd like to see with some championship gold around his fucking waist. Elias is not the best wrestler in the world, but he's got character to actually compensate for that. So whatever he lacks in in-ring skill, the guy makes up in his guitar playing and the way he interacts with the crowd and the way he just brings life to his segment. So putting these two guys in the ring when none of them are proverbial leaders in the ring, or ring generals per se, this is going to equate to a god-awful fucking opening to this show. And then what does WWE do? Because we didn't see this same fucking shit last week. Remember the beatdown by, Bra- uh, by these guys on Braun Strowman? You could fucking queue up the beatdown on Braun Strowman last week. Fucking mechanic by mechanic, footstep by footstep, the exact same blueprint, minus one move here on this show. And that was a move by Drew McIntyre, which was a reverse Alabama slam on Elias on top of the steel steps. This was the same exact fucking thing, move for move, outside that one move by Drew McIntyre, mimicking exactly what they did to Braun Strowman last week. Are you fucking kidding me? And you don't think I noticed that. You didn't think anybody was going to notice that. Why? Why are we booking Braun Strowman and then Elias in the same beatdown, in the same exact way, in back-to-back weeks? Does this company know any creativity whatsoever? Do they fucking care about what they put on television on a week-to-week basis? The answer is no. The answer is no. They are in autopilot mode, and I swear to God, that could not be more of a reality right now. Autopilot till the Royal Rumble. Monday Night Raw is not going to matter. SmackDown Live is not going to matter. And the TLC pay-per-view is not going to matter. At all. They don't take days off in NXT. The only times we get a lackluster NXT show is the day after a takeover. Which, by the way, TakeOver War Games 2, speaking of TakeOver, was the most viewed program for the month of November on the WWE Network, beating out the Survivor Series in viewership. What the fuck does that say about the main roster right now? I would love to see Vince McMahon's face when he sees those numbers and those analytics at the end of the month. Why isn't the main roster beating out NXT? Because NXT is actually a great fucking show, which I still don't believe the WWE logo is even affiliated with that fucking, that program. We want wrestling. We want storytelling. We want engaging characters. I can't say anybody on this show is engaging. I can't say anybody's on this show that is is worth investing my time into. Yes, and the show sucks because of Monday Night Football. Or the show sucks because Roman Reigns is not there. Or because Braun Strowman's not, not, not there. Bullshit! Bullshit! This show has been god awful for five years now. Ever since they went to three hours, this show has been absolutely fucking abysmal. So Elias and Bobby Lashley, Elias got his ass kicked. Bobby Lashley won. And here's another fucking barn burner for you. Baron Corbin made the ruling to make this a no DQ match. Thus, we got the three-on-one beatdown at the end of this match because it was all legal. Whereas when they went into this thing, it was a standard one-on-one match. It was a standard wrestling match, and WWE had to dip into that cookie jar again with the heel authority figure changing rules on the fly. And this is not the first time Baron Corbin's done that. 
How many times have we seen him do that same trick? It's like twin magic with the fucking Bella Twins. It was every fucking week. Every time Baron Corbin wants to abuse his power. Oh, here's one of my buddies in a match. Oh, my buddy lost. Let me start the match over and change the rules to my liking so my buddy wins. This is the best you got. This is the best that you got. You should be fucking ashamed of yourself. And I hope you're watching. Mr. Creative Writer or someone who works in WWE who knows about this fucking show. I hope you're watching and I hope you tell your colleagues. You fucking suck at your job. After the match, Rush takes the microphone and we hear his fucking cringy voice. Bobby Lashley won the match. Who gives a shit? Finn Balor and Baron Corbin was announced in the main event. Whoop the fucking do. Let me go get an ice cream sundae from the parlor down the street and sit down and enjoy the fucking show in excitement. We get into the next match. We got the Revival versus the Lucha House Party. Oh, great. More rinse and repeat. If I want rinse and repeat, I'll leave a fucking sink full of dishes and I'll get back to it when I can. Rinse and repeat. Revival versus the Lucha House Party. Scott Dawson and Dash Wilder come out and they proclaim that, listen, last week you guys contested this match under Lucha House Party rules. You don't appreciate the old school way of tag team wrestling. Tag team wrestling is an art. I wish Vince McMahon would realize that. You have a team like the fucking Revival on this show and they couldn't be any more fucking dead. Dead and gone is the Revival. So we get another rematch with these fucking five guys, and what happens? Lucha House Party comes out, not one, not two, but with three pinatas. Three pinatas. Last week, the Revival were beat on an interference from a fucking pinata, and now this week, the Lucha House Party has three. So this was supposed to be contested under two against two rules in a standard tag team match, and then JoJo's fat ass, man. Bray Wyatt's girl over there, JoJo, announces it as another Lucha House Party match. So we get Lince Dorado, Gran Metalik, and Kalisto burying the Revival again. Again. All three of them did their top rope aerial finishing moves, and they were dead and gone. As always. I don't know how you have a team, like I say this every fucking week, it's like I'm speaking to the fucking Wolves. You have a team like the Revival, and you bury them this fucking badly. Was there a reason why you took this team from NXT to let them fucking rot in this manner on this show? Why? Why? Do you hate NXT that badly? And this is a product of WWE that Vince McMahon does not watch. I don't know how anybody in this company is not watching NXT because NXT is the fucking smart Chinese kid in class who gets 4.0 GPA every year. And Monday Night Raw is the fucking geek sitting in the back of the classroom shooting the spitballs with the fucking 0.79 GPA. Skipping class every day, smoking weed in the fucking back. Look at his fucking test scores. Sit next to him in class. Peek over his shoulder a little bit. You'll have the answers as to what to do concerning characters, character development, storytelling, care, how to put on an actual good show. No, the revival's buried on Monday Night Raw. For what? Why? Now, I understand that they might not be fucking burning down buildings character-wise. They may look bland. They might have, you know, the charisma department a little lacking. But that doesn't mean that when you put those two guys in the ring that they're not going to fucking give you a five-star match. I dare anybody on Monday Night Raw to pop on NXT TakeOver Toronto and watch the two out of three falls match with DIY, Johnny Gargano, Tommaso Ciampa. I dare anybody in this fucking company to tell me straight to my fucking face that the Revival ain't worth anything and you can't do anything with the Revival after watching that match. I dare you to find a fucking excuse as to why you can't book me tag team wrestling on this show when it when it's like second nature to everybody in NXT. You got teams like Oni Lorcan and Danny Burch putting on five star matches this year, and you can't give me that same quality of content on the on the main roster. What am, what, what what are we living in? Is this Seinfeld the Bizarro world? This is a WWE product. 
They thrived in WWE. This is a developmental system. To you people. To me, it's the A show. I don't understand this shit. What if WWE... What if, what if the Atlanta Braves kept Acuna Jr. down in AAA? And then they brought him up, right? He was this budding prospect. He's going to be the leader of the fucking new generation for the Atlanta Braves, right? All this great accolades that he accumulated down in AAA. They're bringing him up because he's got all this praise. He's ready. He's ready. He's ready to go to the big leagues. He's ready to, to, to play ball on the, on the main team. What if they bring him up there and he continues to strike out and strike out and strike out and they continue throwing him out there and throwing him out there and throwing him out there and then they bench him. Then they bench him, never to use him again after all the fucking potential that this guy has. Are you fucking serious? How can you treat top quality talent like this? Loss after loss after loss. Embarrassment after embarrassment every fucking week. In a division that has no standout teams. This division is wide open. Yet you've ruined everybody. There's not one fucking team in the eyes of the fans in which we could look at as, wow, those guys are head and above the class in WWE Tag Team Wrestling. They are the team to beat. Everybody is a fucking loser. Every team is a fucking loser. I swear on everything that is holy, if All Elite Wrestling shows up in the United States with a TV deal, if I'm Scott Dawson and Dash Wilder, I'm walking out like Neville did, and I'm fucking quitting. And I'm burning the WWE bridge for the fact that they burned their careers. And I'm going with Matt and Nick Jackson, and I'm wrestling for those guys, and I'm putting on the fucking matches that WWE wishes they had on the main roster. Fucking disgraceful. Absolutely fucking disgraceful. These two guys put on one of the best tag team matches that I've ever seen in 32 years watching this product. And this is the best that you got for them. Fuck you, WWE. Seriously. Go fuck yourselves. Lucha House Party wins. Revival gets to eat cheesecake early on Titus Catering. Nia Jax. I will not be replaying her promo because she is fucking terrible. Absolutely fucking terrible. She should be on her hands and knees if she could even bend down that far. Praying to whatever God she prays to. That she punched Becky Lynch in the face. Becky's bigger than she ever was after the incident. Nia Jax is lucky to be the woman, to be the one to break Becky's face, quote-unquote. Because without that, this woman is absolutely in Bobby Lashley territory. She is fucking terrible. I don't know who overlooked this script on Monday Night Raw and decided to give Nia Jax 10 minutes of microphone time to talk about Ronda Rousey. WWE hyped this segment up as WWE presents Nia Jax giving us a lesson in the women's champion. A lesson in women's championship or women's history for the women's championship? Are you out of your fucking... Who the fuck wrote this segment and what were you smoking? So please pass the fucking joint. I don't understand. Nia Jax is going to give me knowledge and history on the women's product? What are you going to tell me that I don't or that I don't already know? That the women's division is fucking terrible on both shows outside Becky Lynch? What is Nia Jax going to tell me that I don't already know? Nia Jax giving lessons? Let me tell you something, honey. You need a lesson in actually how to wrestle. You need a lesson at the performance center to fucking brush up on the green fucking amateur skills that you possess. Giving me a lesson in what? A lesson in cringe? Man, you check that off almost immediately. Absolutely fucking ridiculous. Jax takes the microphone. Fans start booing. She talks about how everyone is thankful for her being the sole survivor for Team Raw at Survivor Series. Yes, we're, we're, we're very thankful, Miss Jax. We're very thankful that we get to bestow upon your greatness. Said nobody ever. 
She's most thankful for, for breaking Becky Lynch's face and putting her on the shelf with a concussion. Now, you should be thanking your lucky stars that you were in that moment and you were the person to do it. Otherwise, you'd be a fucking irrelevant soul on this show. Jack says Becky Lynch was no match for the face breaker. Jack says Raw Women's Champion Ronda Rousey wanted to face Becky so bad, but she took that from her. Jack says Rousey better get used to her taking things from her because she's taking the title at TLC. Jax goes on about how Rousey came into WWE on top of that and put her run uh, in a situation where it's all went downhill since their match at Money in the Bank at uh, the, in June in Chicago. So Jax goes on mocking Rousey and we see highlights from the beatdown that Charlotte gave her where WWE is so scared that Charlotte is not going to receive the reaction that they so desire, so they're turning her, in, turning her into Becky Lynch 2.0 because Becky just somehow, miraculously, came out the biggest fucking name in this entire company and WWE is running scared because all their plans, their beloved plans for Charlotte and Ronda Rousey at WrestleMania were turned upside down and now they have to include Becky Lynch and Becky Lynch is blowing everybody else away as far as fan reaction and WWE can't grasp, they can't believe it, they can't stand it, that Charlotte is, is just second fiddle to everybody now, so they have to make Charlotte look as, as good as Becky Lynch, so how do they do that, well, we'll book her like Becky Lynch, we'll book, you like, we'll book her like Becky, and it won't work, it won't work, it will fail, miserably, and if they think it's going to work, man, I hope that they fucking have a smile on their face, <laughs> it's gonna work, it's going to work, and then when it happens, and then when it happens, it's going to fall flat on its face. So I wait the day. I await the day in which WWE thinks it's going to work, and then Charlotte is right back to square one when feeding off Becky is not the right way to go. Charlotte's a little bit more interesting. I'll give her that. I said, oh my God, I, I'm not good enough. She's a lot better now, so she's a lot more, at least a little bit more interesting. But is she somebody that people are going to invest their time in over Char over uh, over Becky? Nah, not at all. So Rhonda comes out, and this is where my eyes roll in the back of my head so far that I'm at this point mimicking the fucking Undertaker. Ronda Rousey comes out after all this shit that Nia Jax just spoke in Rousey's name. Ronda comes out with her. Piper jacket on, comes out in her wrestling gear with the Raw Women's Championship draped over her shoulder. Her music hits, she comes down the aisle smiling and laughing. And get this, she starts giving high fives to the little kids along the railing down the ramp. Now, I don't know why you would have Rousey come down the aisle smiling and shaking people's hands and giving high fives to little children in the front row. Why? I mean, is it logical when you have a monster of a woman in Nia Jax talking about how your career went downhill, how you how she's going to break her, your face just like she did Becky and take your Raw Women's Championship and how you're, you're overrated and all this other shit? Does it make sense for Rousey to come out smiling after hearing all of that? It reminded me of when Alexa Bliss did the entire uh, Bailey, This Is Your Life. And she's just standing there, just ripping into Bailey and going over, you know, Bailey's boyfriends about how she wasn't loved and how she was a bad kisser and how she was a bad student and how she was a nerd and how she dreamt about being a WWE superstar. And Bailey's in the back after 20 fucking minutes listening to all this. And then after 20 minutes, she comes out. It would have been within the first two or three minutes that I would have came out and beat this woman's face in. Yet Ronda Rousey's coming out smiling. For what? This is Ronda Rousey, the baddest bitch on the planet. Can you have her come down the aisle not smiling, pissed, angry, frustrated, looking to break an arm? And why does she need to shake children's hands? She could do that after the fucking show's over and after the cameras are off. Do you know how ridiculous and illogical that looks? Yet I'll have people on social media and all these other irrelevant podcasts. Oh, well, Rhonda sounded good. No, she didn't. She looked and sounded awful. And Nia Jax 
sounded fucking miserable. 10 minutes with a microphone in her hand and she drowned a miserable death in front of that live crowd. Rhonda, I don't know what the fuck she said, but all I remember when Rhonda was speaking is that it sounded like she forgot her fucking lines. Every single word that came out of her mouth, it looked like she was struggling to remember what she was saying. Yet you're sending this woman out there in a feud with Nia Jax, a feud that I'm sure she has absolutely no interest in because she wants Becky Lynch because she now has to do this because of WWE's political agenda by giving Nia Jax the, the battle royal at Evolution. And you know why they gave her that win at Evolution. So now we're stuck with this bullshit. So as far as I'm concerned, Nia Jax is lucky she broke Becky's face because without that, this match has nothing. Nothing. This match and the build for it, it fell into WWE's lap. Lackadaisical, lazy, unwanted, yes. But without that punch to Becky's face, this feud and Nia's push and her popularity now as a heel is nothing. This was god-awful. Rousey wants to fight. She mentions a double date with Snooker tonight. Are you just going to stand back there, or, or do you two have a double date tonight? Rousey wants to fight. Fans want to see it. I don't. Jack says we're not going to do it like that. She could beat Rousey right now, but she just finished washing Becky's crusted blood off of her knuckles. She goes on with excuses, and Rousey tells her to just fight. Jack says she's not making excuses. She's just stalling for time. She drops the microphone, and both Snooker and Jax surround Ronda Rousey. Natalia's music hit. Natalia comes out, tries to make the save, but she's jumped by the Riot Squad, all three of them. Ruby Riot, Liv Morgan, and Sarah Logan, they come out of nowhere. Rousey goes to help Natalia as the Riot Squad runs away like a bunch of fucking gazelle. And they retreat off the stage. Jackson Snooker look on from the ring, smiling with Natalia looking up. <laughs> I still can't get revenge for my father's glasses. <laughs> I try to do right. <laughs> Spare me the fucking tears. Nobody gives a shit. I missed one very important detail here. Dean Ambrose. Dean Ambrose was apparently, uh, I don't know if he was backstage or if he was at a medical facility because we're not allowed to say hospital anymore on WWE programming. Uh, D we had Dean Ambrose receiving shots he was receiving shots from a random physician, or, or I guess his personal physician. So he's sitting there on, on, the, on, the, on the table, on the doctor's table. They've got the doctor in the background fuddling with fucking needles and, and wipes and syringes and all this other shit. He's pretending to be busy while Ambrose is talking, pretty much. And Dean says he is getting various shots so he won't catch the disease... And the stench that people carry around, including a rabies shot in his rear end. That's what they said. That was the terminology that they used, a.k.a. his ass. Ambrose says, no shower will wash away Rollins' sins because he's a lost cause. Ambrose says he will put Rollins out of his misery at TLC. So, let me get this straight. I mentioned this to my buddy Jesse, who I frequently go back and forth with on Monday and Tuesday nights during these horrific fucking programs. So, we got Dean Ambrose here, and I'm trying to grasp and understand what his character is on this show. What exactly is Dean Ambrose's character on this show? Is he a lunatic? Is he a psychopath? Is, the, is he the leader of the Ambrose Asylum? Are we going to end up seeing a John Moxley-like character here? You know, the proper role for Dean Ambrose would be not so much a John Moxley character where he's fucking brutalizing people left and right, but I would have him play like a loose cannon-like gimmick. Not like Brian Pillman, not like where Pillman's pulling guns out on Stone Cold Steve Austin on Monday Night Raw or anything like that, but... A, a Brian Pillman loose cannon-like fucking character where he's just lost his fucking mind. But here we got Dean Ambrose putting down the audience, telling everybody that they smell and that they're fat and that they're, they're poor and they're homeless and they don't know any better. 
what is this shit? Is Dean Ambrose character someone who tells me about a generic fucking prototypical, stereotypical internet wrestling fan and how they're disgusting? Or does he have a problem with Roman Reigns and Seth Rollins and how they held him back in the shield all these years? What is his gimmick? And now he's receiving shots so that he can't get, catch a disease from all these towns that he goes to because the people are fucking smelly and they carry viruses. You people. Maybe the people who, who write this show need a fucking shot. And maybe with that shot comes some fucking logic and common sense. Do they have a fucking shot for that? I would sign everybody up willingly, wholeheartedly with my own hard-earned cash. If I could get a shot that pumps logic into WWE's blood veins. I'm still trying to understand where this Dean Ambrose character is going. You know, we had the turn on Seth Rollins, and that was the highlight, or one of the highlights of the year on this fucking piss poor program. And ever since that turn, Ambrose has gone down fucking hill. You know, honestly, Dean Ambrose was a little bit more entertaining when he, when he didn't talk at all. When he didn't say a fucking word, Ambrose was more engaging, and I would invest more time in the silent Dean Ambrose. Now that he opened his mouth and he's just being a fucking lame, uncreative heel, and they got fucking creative fucking goons riding for him, making him sound completely idiotic and uninteresting, I don't give a shit anymore. I really don't give a shit anymore. And Seth Rollins being the Intercontinental Champion, does this feud, the way it's been built, the way it circulates around Roman Reigns, and the reason why Dean Ambrose turned on everybody because he feels held back after five years of being in the Shield, being associated with Rollins and Reigns, or uh, Rollins and Reigns. Does, does the title really mean anything to this feud? I don't think so. So if I'm WWE, I'm taking the title off Seth Rollins. That title would look a lot better on Elias, on Finn Balor, on a Drew McIntyre. Or what I stated many, 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 many months ago, but WWE still has him in a fucking tag team with Chad Gable. You could turn Bobby Roode heel and give me the prick-like fucking heel in NXT that we've seen with Bobby Roode, turn him into a heel, and have him feud with Seth Rollins for the Intercontinental Championship, and give me the glorious one once again. And then we can get Bobby Roode as the Intercontinental Champion instead of him, another NXT alum, wasting away on this fucking piss-poor show. This match does not need, or this feud rather, does not need the Intercontinental Championship. Because if Rollins is playing into the fact of Lesnar at WrestleMania, he's not going to need the Intercontinental Championship unless WWE wants to give me IC title versus Universal Championship and a winner-take-all at WrestleMania. I would rather that title be defended at WrestleMania, being that it's the number one title realistically on Monday Night Raw. Get it on someone who's going to do it proud. Because the feud right now between Ambrose and Rollins is a blood feud. You know, Gargano and Champa didn't need the title. In the very beginning stages of this feud, they didn't need the NXT Championship. Because there was so much there. There was so much hostility there. That the title would have been second rate. It wouldn't have been a priority. Same thing means here. Well, the same thing is going to happen here. The IC title is not needed with Rollins and Ambrose. Build it like you would build Gargano and Champa. The title should go to somebody else who's going to do it better. That's just my two cents on that. Moving on here, man. We had Drake Maverick. Drake Maverick. They continued to go over how he peed himself at Survivor Series. And how Bobby Roode and Chad Gable mocked him backstage last week with toilet humor. So we also see how they picked up a non-title win over AOPP last week. So Drake Maverick and the Authors of Pain are backstage. Drake says, everyone had a laugh at his expense last week. He talks about how most people haven't picked up uh, by, uh, or how most people haven't been picked up by a giant like he was, by the big show. But if you did, you'd probably wet yourself too. No, I asked him uh, if he would be my raid partner in Destiny 2. And maybe we could do a raid together if he choked me. I'm not going to pee my pants. Because I know Big Show's a big Destiny player. Drake talks about fear. 
I am very fearful of Monday Night Raw every single week at 8 p.m. on the USA Network and how they're going to waste my fucking time for three hours. But he was talking about fear and how he felt. And he says he will make sure Rude and Gable feel the same fear tonight. Akam and Rezar throw a warning at the number one contenders. Oops. That's another one of Vince McMahon's banned terms in his weird, sick, demented mind. Common sense and logic are also on that fucking list, apparently, with a show like this. Raw Tag Team title match, Chad Gable and Bobby Roode versus the Authors of Pain. You know, the Authors of Pain were undefeated for over a year in NXT. They were the NXT Tag Team Champions for many, many months. They were led by Paul Ellering, who managed Animal and Hawk of the Road Warriors. One of the most iconic names in all of Tag Team Wrestling history. They won the Dusty Rhodes Tag Tag Team Classic in honor of Dusty Rhodes. They competed in the first ever WWE War Games and they destroyed their opponents inside that cage. But here on Monday Night Raw, after many accolades in NXT for the time that they were allotted down there, on Monday Night Raw, they can't win a match on their own unless Drake Maverick steals Bobby Roode's robe Tonight it was blue. His glorious blue robe. They can't win a match unless Drake Maverick causes a distraction with Bobby Roode's robe, takes the robe to the men's room in the arena they were in tonight, places it in the toilet bowl, unzips his pants, and pisses on Bobby Roode's robe, and then flushes the toilet. Or the the toilet flush automatically. And Drake didn't wash his hands, by the way. Disgusting. This show is fucking horrendous. A-O-P-P. A-O-P-P. I am not at all surprised they changed their name. After this is the direction that they went in, they took away the name Authors of Pain and made A-O-P-P simply to make piss jokes out of their name. They put them with Drake Maverick who is not even the size of Akam's leg, and now they're going to listen to a guy that is one-fourth of their size. Paul Ellering is nowhere to be found. Paul Ellering, I believe, said that he would travel and that all the news about him not wanting to travel was all bullshit. And here we got AOPP with Drake Maverick. And now they're winning matches because Drake is pissing on their opponent's ring attire. I don't believe what I am watching on this show. Again, the same thing with the Revival. A team like the Authors of Pain should be the... They should realistically be the Tyrannosaurus Rex of this Jurassic Park for this tag team division. And they are not. They are not. They are a fucking irrelevant dinosaur that is getting eaten by the Tyrannosaurus Rex named Vince McMahon. This is disgusting. And I don't understand the lack of fucking care for their talent coming up from NXT. Vince McMahon is signing the NXT paychecks. NXT is hemorrhaging money from the WWE bank account to put on shows. They are utilizing talent to get them ready to build the future of certain parts of this company. You cannot tell me that this is the best that you have for two guys the size of the Authors of Pain. And then they beat Chad Gable and Bobby Roode with this with this toilet humor fucking distraction. And then they hold the tag team titles up in the air as if they mean something. You might as well flush the tag team titles down the toilet and pissed on them too. At that point, they would have been a little bit more prestigious. That is all they're worth. They are nothing more. They are worthless. A bucket of Drake's piss is worth more than the tag team championships. And that is WWE's fault. That is WWE's fault. Disgusting. I have no more words for what I'm watching here. And we'll probably get Chad Gable and Bobby Roode getting another rematch. We'll probably get another tag team title match at the TLC pay-per-view because of this toilet humor-like distraction. 
And then the AOP will lose again for a second time in one month. Whereas in NXT, they were undefeated for a year. And they will lose their tag team championships. And then they can join the Revival in Titus Catering, eating green beans and mashed potatoes and breaded chicken and fucking lasagna and whatever else Titus has on the fucking menu. They will finally be where they were destined to be all along. Irrelevant. You might as well have just put them there to begin with. Say hello to the Revival, Dash, Dawson, and Andrade Cien Almas. What's up, bro? I see you back there. How you doing, man? Five-star match? Fuck it. Fuck it. Gargano? Who? Vanilla Midget? Take over Philadelphia? Remember that? I didn't watch it. I didn't watch it. This is Monday Night Raw. This is where the big league. This is where the big boys play. Where the big boys play. Take over? Fuck it. For you indie marks, five-star match. Fuck that shit. I'm going to give you Rollins and fucking Ziggler again. Fuck that. This show sucks. Ember Moon versus Alicia Fox. I would be lying to you if I said I watched this match. I was on my phone looking at YouTube videos. I don't fucking care. Now, with Braun Strowman, man, Ember Moon, who the fuck did she piss off in this company, man? Ember Moon was in the mixed match challenge with her partner being Braun Strowman. Braun Strowman go down, goes down with injury. Do you know who they give Ember Moon as a, replacement, as a replacement partner? I can't fucking speak tonight. Stuttering all over the fucking place. This is, this is the fucking, the, the, the amount of fucking garbage on this show. It's fucking, it's deteriorating me at my young age. Do you know who they give Ember Moon as a fucking tag team partner replacement? Kurt Hawkins. The guy who's accumulated 200 and fucking 20 some odd losses. You mean to tell me that you couldn't find a better fucking partner for Ember Moon? Isn't Zack Ryder doing something? Is he still employed? Or is he playing with fucking Funko Pop and WWE Mattel Elite Action Figures at home with Chelsea Green? What the fuck's he doing? Ember Moon versus Alicia Fox. Ember Moon wins with an eclipse. Alicia Fox is fucking awful. Keep her off of television, please. Ember Moon wins after the match. Moon and Hawkins celebrate up the ramp. No way Jose somehow still has a job here. His music interrupts. He comes out with the conga line. Hawkins joins them because he was a part of a winning team. Jinder is waiting in the ring. No way Jose heads to the ring dancing. And we get a match with Jinder Mahal and No Way Jose. And I honestly think I slipped into some fucking fifth dimensional time warp. And I can't find myself back. I am I am at this point thinking I am in a nightmare. You know, Michael Cole continues to mention Jinder Mahal as a former WWE champion. Why must you bring that up? How is this relevant in this situation? The guy went from the guy went from WWE championship. The guy went from ruining SmackDown Live. And now he is fighting No Way Jose on Monday Night Raw in the second hour of the show. Yeah, but he's a WWE champion. Former WWE champion. Man, Jinder Mahal would be right there with Bobby Lashley on the unemployment line. The guy is fucking worthless. These guys serve no purpose on Monday Night Raw. Jinder Mahal wins with a coloss. Man, I couldn't wait to see the reaction after that one from the WWE audience. Rollins versus Ziggler for the Intercontinental Championship. You know, I mentioned this already. I mentioned this already, and I'm going to mention it again. How many fucking times do we need to see this? Out of all the fucking talent that you got on this roster, never mind Monday Night Raw, on this roster, could have been anybody but Dolph Ziggler. Like, I honestly don't know. Like, I would love to be a fly on the wall when people come up with the script to this show and they plan out a, 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 I keep saying U.S. Open Challenge because I'm so fucking, it's so synonymous with John Cena. The last time an Open Challenge was actually worth anything was when John Cena did it with the United States title. At least then we seen, we seen talent step up. We seen talent step up. We seen Sami Zayn and Neville, to be exact, step up to John Cena. And those were some damn good fucking matches. And it actually made sense with John Cena being the U.S. champion doing the open challenge. Now, the open challenge to me now, 
I used to love the Open Challenge. I think the Open Challenge is a great idea, but WWE seems to go back to it every now and then when they need time to fill for a segment. This, now, the Open Challenge means to me that WWE Creative is lazy, they have absolutely nothing going on because Ambrose is not there, and they need something for Seth Rollins to do, so why not? We'll do an Open Challenge as it ties into literally nothing Moving forward, it's got a nice ring to it, it gets the crowd excited, yet it lacks creativity and it just spells laziness to everybody. And how many times has Rollins done the open challenge? He's done it way too many times for now, you know, for it to mean anything. So nobody gives a shit. And then, of all people, Dolph Ziggler comes out. You know, yet Zack Ryder, right on social media, you know, I, I think I'm free, he says to, to Seth Rollins when he announced the Open Challenge. I think I'm free on Monday night. Ricochet even challenged him. Ricochet comes out. Title for title, he says. You know, what about Adam Cole? Could have debuted Lars Sullivan in this instance. Lars Sullivan versus Seth Rollins. First match on Monday Night Raw for the Intercontinental Championship. Could have been Pete Dunne. Could have been Mustafa Ali. You got the fucking Lucha House goons on Monday Night Raw, but Mustafa Ali is yet to find his way to Monday Night Raw. What a match that would be. Seth Rollins versus Mustafa Ali. Take my fucking money. Buddy Murphy. You want to start using cruiserweights and people from 205 Live? Why the fuck not? Create a new star. Get some new eyes on some talent that the casual fucking idiots in the audience aren't prone to seeing. How about a Cedric Alexander? A Tyler Breeze coming out as Prince Pretty and not this fucking fashion police bullshit. You got guys like that sitting in the fucking back. The human highlight reel, right? The human highlight reel. Apollo Crews just started pushing him for two weeks. Where's he been since? Back to fucking catering. He was one of those guys in which WWE had to push because they had nobody else. And now he's off the fucking show because he was going nowhere. He got no reaction and he was just the flavor of the week. Could have even been Apollo Crews. Could have been anybody. Could have been anybody. The one person I'm glad it's not is Bray Wyatt. Because even though Bray Wyatt is still, still lingering and leaving pa- bad tastes in people's mouths because of the way he's been booked, I'm glad it wasn't Bray Wyatt because with a guy like Bray Wyatt and that type of character, he should come back and it should mean something. It should truly mean something. Slightly repackage him, bring back the Wyatt family, get Strowman involved, bring him back with Harper, get his brother Bo. Get Bo Dallas away from the fucking B team. Repackage Curtis Axel as the fucking legit son of Kurt Henning and relive the days of fucking Mr. Perfect through his son. Get Bo Dallas back into a meaningful role with Bray Wyatt. Get the Wyatt family back together. Start piecing in 2019 fucking characters for these people. Start molding them into situations where they could fucking mean something on this show. Anybody would have been better than Dolph Ziggler. And we all knew going into this match, Dolph Ziggler wasn't going to win the Intercontinental Championship, so what the fuck does it matter if they gave us a great match tonight? Oh, but JD was a great match. Who gives a fuck? Who gives a fuck? They did this same match how many fucking times? We've literally seen the same match since fucking June. June. When was Extreme Rules? May? June? I'm over it. I'm over it. You know, when you give people something every single week, when you give them the same fucking shit every single week, that's like a fucking parent giving their children the same fucking TV dinner every fucking week, they're eventually going to spit it out. They're going to spit it out and say, Mommy, I want something different. Vince McMahon doesn't think the fans want something different. The fans were chanting, This is awesome. To that... To that, Vince McMahon is doing the right thing because you fucking idiots in Milwaukee are chanting, this is awesome, this is great, you guys are reacting to it. I would have sat there on my fucking hands and I would have sat there with a fucking frown that would make the Grinch jealous if I seen this shit. Who could possibly fucking care? Ziggler was never going to win the championship. Nobody going into that would have won the championship. It would have been nice if it was somebody different to take me off the fucking edge of my couch and make me believe in something happening like a title change. Maybe a ricochet, maybe a Mustafa Ali. Something. This show needs something like that. But they refuse to do it. They refuse to do it. 
WWE is never going to give you anything but Rollins and Ambrose at TLC. There was no reason to believe Ziggler was going to win this match. Michael Cole, seven times. You know, he was almost a seven-time Intercontinental Champ. Who gives a shit? And why is he away from Drew? Why is he not included in this new unnamed, unofficial stable that apparently is taking over Monday Night Raw? Why do we need just random stables being formed with general managers running rampant on this show? Why is there so much Corbin? I don't understand it. I don't understand it. Rollins wins with a Falcon Arrow. Falcon Arrow. That's all I'm going to say. If you've seen one of their matches already, you know how it went. Near fall, near fall, kick out, zigzag, kick out, goes for a stomp, kick out, blocks it. Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Somebody in WWE thinks Finn Balor versus Baron Corbin is the main event that people are going to care about. They're going to tune in to watch Finn Balor and Baron Corbin in the main event. Before we get to the main event, I want to stress this, that they made the announcement of Finn Balor versus Baron Corbin, but that's all they mentioned. That's all they mentioned. Finn Balor went on his phone and filmed the promo via his phone, and they showed it on the Titantron, calling him a fucking uh, whatever he said. I don't even remember what he said. He was talking shit to Baron Corbin, and that's all we heard. Now, what does Finn Balor have to do with Baron Corbin nowadays where it warrants a main event on Monday Night Raw. This is the main event you're giving me, and this is exactly how you're going to be losing viewership. This was mentioned once at the beginning of the fucking show in the 8 o'clock hour, and it wasn't mentioned again at all. Nothing was built. Nothing was hyped. There was no storyline-driven agenda here with these two guys throughout the entirety of this show, yet they're in the main event of this show with nothing on the line. Nothing. No championship, no number one contender, no spot in a a particular match, nothing. Nothing was mentioned throughout the entirety of this program, yet they're in the main event, and yet somehow WWE expects me to fucking care about Finn Balor and Baron Corbin in the main event. How is this going to retain audience by the end of the show? This is exactly what's going to drive viewership away. And before we get into the main event and the ending of this fucking review, before the main event, somehow Alexa Bliss was named the head of the women's division. She's going to oversee all activities in the women's division. Now, Baron Corbin made this announcement in the 8 o'clock hour after he did what he did to Elias with McIntyre and Bobby Lashley. Alexa Bliss comes over. And she looks in Baron Corbin's eyes and says, man, that was impressive because Baron Corbin apparently fired somebody over the lights going out and when he turned the lights back on, how could you embarrass me by keeping the lights off that long and how could you send Elias out there? So he fired some fucking goon with the headset on. So he was like, get the fuck out of here. Get out of my building. Alexa Bliss comes over and says, man, that was impressive. And he's like, I need you to do something for me because I can't do it all. You look good, and when you look good, I look good. So we made Alexa Bliss the head and shoulders of the women's division, the overseer of the women's division. So she goes into the locker room with Bailey and Sasha Banks, and instead of putting them in a match, she put them in an open Q&A segment. Now, they were sitting in the ring, and Alexa Bliss was pointing around the audience as if they were going to give anybody a live fucking microphone on Monday Night Raw, you know? Looking around the audience, making fun of people, pointing out their deficiencies and their looks. So then she points over to somebody who clearly was a fucking plant. She she looked the part just by standing out like a fucking sore thumb wearing a white Ronda Rousey t-shirt. And she goes over and hands the microphone to this person. And, and I quote, this was the question that was asked. In the most simplest fucking way possible. Bailey and Sasha sitting in the ring. And she's like, Well, how would you change the Raw Women's Division? So, Bailey, Bailey 
is the first one to answer this question. And Bailey says she's proud of the division and wouldn't change a thing. Really now? You wouldn't change a thing. So Sasha Banks takes the microphone. And God only knows what that woman would really say. That's what I would ask her if she is no longer a WWE employee. I would fucking suck the soul out of her so bad, man. I'd fucking dig down deep and try and get the fucking real juice from Sasha Banks. She says, the only thing that I would change is to ship Alexa Bliss back to SmackDown Live. No, Sasha, I think you should ship yourself back to SmackDown or to SmackDown Live, not back. But you should ship yourself and Bailey while you're at it to SmackDown Live. Please get off this show. Please get off this show. And I pray to God, honey, I hope that you didn't sign a new deal with the WWE. And if there's a spot open with Cody in the box and Kenny Omega in that nice little promotion called All Elite Wrestling that was just trademarked, make yourself comfy over there. I'm sure they'll utilize you and, and let you actually try and attain the status of greatest female performer in the world. So... We get Sasha saying that, and then all of a sudden, this leads to Bailey saying, you know, I, I wouldn't send Bliss back to SmackDown Live. In fact, I'd send Bliss back to hell where she came from. And then all of a sudden, Mickey James, Dana Brooke, and Alicia Fox end up attacking Bailey and Banks. We've seen Alicia Fox on multiple occasions on this show. If that's not pathetic in itself, I don't know what to tell you people. Yet you paid money to be there. You paid money to, to, to attend Monday Night Raw to see Alicia Fox on multiple occasions. Wow, man. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad you guys ended up satisfied with your purchase. There's chaos. Bailey and Banks end up clearing the ring, standing tall. And that was it. That was it. A waste of a segment. Finn Balor and Baron Corbin. Remember how there was no storyline driven anything with these two? For them to warrant a main event spot? Well... They're the main event. So, we get Balor. Balor was about, I think Balor won this match. Um, Deep six for a two count. Balor goes on, counters, taking Corbin down for a double stomp. Corbin ends up rolling to the floor. Balor goes to the top for coup de gras. Corbin takes the microphone. Balor didn't even win. He was about to win the match with coup de gras. Corbin takes the microphone and then announces it's a two-on-one handicap match. Corbin introduces his partner, and out comes Drew McIntyre. So McIntyre makes his way to the ring. Balor leaps out, takes him out at ringside after dropping Corbin. Balor sends Corbin into the timekeeper's area, but McIntyre comes from behind and clotheslines him. McIntyre drops Balor onto the barricade, and then followed up by a Claymore kick in the ring. One, two, three. Bobby Lashley, Baron Corbin, and Drew McIntyre all celebrate at the end of this thing, talking trash, and that was it. That's the way Raw goes off the air as they're all posing, happy about their job well done tonight. This easily, easily, I, I mean, Monday Night Raw, it's like they don't book to get better. Their mentality, from what I see on these shows, is how do we make the shows worse every single week? How do we make the show this week worse than last week? Now, I can predict what's going to happen here. We're going to see Baron Corbin, Drew McIntyre, and Bobby Lashley next week versus Finn Balor. We're going to see Elias, and we're going to see who else was beaten up. It was Strowman. We'll, we'll probably get like a two-on-three handicap match here. We'll probably get... McIntyre, Corbin, and Bobby Lashley versus Balor and Elias in a handicap match next week. Or a mixture of the two. We'll probably get Finn Balor versus Bobby Lashley or Elias versus Drew McIntyre or some, something along those lines where Baron Corbin is, you know, overseeing everything and just making rules up as they go. This show is fucking horrendous. Absolutely horrendous. Monday Night Raw, you know, Cody... Cody Rhodes, the last thing I'm going to say. Cody Rhodes actually tweeted out at the end of Monday Night Raw. You know, is it really as bad as you're saying it is? He didn't say anything. That's all he said. We, everybody knew what he was talking about because he's seen all the backlash on social media. Uh, Cody, my friend, I've been a fan for 32 years. This is the worst WWE has ever looked in the 32 years I've watched this product. 
This show, Monday Night Raw, is one of the worst fucking wrestling shows in the history of this sport. Right now in its current state. Vince McMahon needs a change. Vince McMahon needs to fucking be removed from the position that he's in right now. And change needs to happen in 2019. If the WWE looks themselves in the mirror when they offer Cody Rhodes, the Young Bucks, and Kenny Omega the fucking godlike amount of money that I'm sure that I'm sure that they're going to be offered, and they wonder why those four individuals did not come to the WWE after all the money that they threw at them. I want them to look back on this show, and I want this to be the very reason as to why those four men did not walk into Stamford, Connecticut, at WWE headquarters and accept a position and a role and a contract with this company. This show is fucking absolutely abysmal, and I have no other words for this. Simon of What Culture, Brian Zane of Wrestling With Regret, Ali Davis and Luke Owen of Wrestle Talk, Justin Labar, everybody else covering this fucking show, Steven Larson, everybody in the community, BC Amplified, I want every single fucking one of you to speak the fucking truth about this fucking garbage. If anyone has a platform in which you are speaking to an audience or you have a fan base and you praise this show in any fucking way possible, I swear upon everything that is holy on this fucking planet, you don't deserve a microphone, you don't deserve a fucking position in which you have right now to speak publicly to human beings who are wrestling fans. I am. I mean this wholeheartedly. I mean this wholeheartedly. If you don't think this show needs a change, then you are the absolute root of the problem. I am done. I am done. I don't give a fuck what I have to do if I have to start a hashtag on Raw to get people's attention. The fact that my tweet to Vince McMahon got a thousand fucking likes in about 20 minutes speaks volumes. I want everybody to look at that tweet and it's going to be pinned on my Twitter. I want that shit to go viral. I am sick to my stomach over this fucking program. We as fans do not deserve this. Vince McMahon has to be out of his fucking mind if he thinks people, you know, we are only the minor or the the, the little vocal minority on social media. The fans need to fucking wake up. Wake the fuck up. I want that tweet, I want that shit to be fucking staring him in the face at some point tomorrow. Change is needed. I beg of you. This show has absolutely zero positive to come out of it. And if you mention one fucking thing positive about this show, fuck you. 100 times over. I'm done.